Hey, uh, welcome to you all. Welcome to our worship service. Uh, my name is Bermy Dizon and I serve as pastor of Grace Life, a congregation of Grace Communion International here in Glendora, California. Uh, before we proceed, I'd like to greet our member, our friend, a happy birthday to Mark Corpus. Today, it's Mark's birthday. And um, if you may not realize it, but something historic is happening. And while we are all facing uh, challenges in the middle of a global pandemic, uh, what many may not realize is that we are also experiencing a season of great spiritual awakening. And all over the world, people are searching for answers and searching for hope. And what millions are finding is, is actually an invitation into a relationship with God. And during the past uh, few weeks, actually, uh, we have witnessed God moving in amazing ways as more people are searching the Bible. They're searching for hope and peace, and more people are looking for comfort and, and solutions that they cannot find somewhere else. And this is a time for the church, a time of opportunity and hope for the church of Jesus Christ. Would you believe it? This is the eighth worship service done online. And I'm sure most of us are looking forward to the end of this pandemic. Because none of us were actually prepared for this one. Especially in this 21st century with science and technology, uh, we, we think this will never happen. But they do happen, and it did. Uh, but these events, actually, when we look at history, are not uncommon for the church. Because for centuries, the church of the Lord Jesus has gone through all kinds of calamities, wars, epidemics, government chains. Uh, in, in all of those, the good news is that the church of Jesus Christ has endured. It has persisted. It has even multiplied and it grew. And the scriptures tells us that the gates of hell will never ever prevail against the church as the church moves forward. No matter what situation we are in, the church moves forward following our Lord Jesus' direction, surrendered wherever Jesus leads us. And the word is adaptability, meaning being yielded and, and surrendered to our Lord Jesus, meaning we walk with Him and follow Him wherever He leads us. And though sometimes it may be hazy and foggy, we have the assurance because Jesus is with us and, we, and so we move with Him. So you and I are committed to doing just that. So somebody asked me, what does the church look like? during this pandemic it's a good question and i think it is this it is the same church that that jesus christ started a church that grows into christ likeness that's what a healthy church looks like looking more and more like jesus and what does a healthy church look like well a healthy church is a church that grows in its love love for god that's a healthy church a healthy church is one that grows in loving others and in, in serving, serving the world and, and the community. And the community or the neighborhood is defined in two ways. It is both uh, geographical and also relational. But in this time of pandemic, because we are isolated, our community is now more defined based on relationships. So we express our love of God in, in many ways. And one big way is loving God. In loving God is worshiping God like we have now having a church service. You know, who would have thought that our worship team will be most active during this pandemic? Uh, for eight weeks now, uh, our team has put together these worship services. Because I admit, I, I cannot do it alone. And um, so I just want to thank uh, Jillian Morrison, who leads the group. I thank Stephen Morrison, who creatively uh, puts together the worship services uh, with his computer. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Megan Molina. She is our worship uh, director. 
I'm grateful also for uh, her amazing team, uh, Jesus Molina, David Dizon, Caitlin Pulmano, Gian Pulmano, Anika Maninang, and also EJ Maninang. We are just so blessed to have these young ones in the church. I also thank uh, Janet Morrison, who serves as our children's church director. Um, thanks also to our preaching team, uh, Dr. Mike Morrison. He also does uh, our weekly Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Uh, Bible studies. And to the others, uh, thank you, uh, those who helped me with speaking, uh, Jillian, Barb Edwards, and Esser. And by the way, they are the ones who are going to give us uh, short messages uh, today, uh, focusing on Psalms uh, 23. Thanks also to Ting Beho, uh, who contributes uh, uh, giving us devotionals from time to time. And I tell you, honestly, it is not easy to speak before a camera with no audience. So I'm kind of right now just imagining people at the back of the computer here. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, that's, that's like what I'm doing right now. S sometimes it can be a little noisy, some distractions, but hey, that's real life. And I thank you, you. I thank you all for um, uh, participating and worshiping with us, uh, for joining uh, us in this worship. I thank you so much for your prayers. I thank you for your encouragement. Yes, uh, we do need the encouragement because we are but human. We do get discouraged from time to time and we really appreciate your loving support. Uh, we do need them. Um, someone asked me, um, how can we love others and serve the world when most of us cannot even go outside our house? Uh, that's a good question. There's a survey done by Christian Ministry just last week by Michio Alliance and Fresh Expression on uh, they had a survey on what do people need the most during this pandemic and here are the things that came out uh, from the from their survey amazingly number one is emotional uh, well-being uh, because they say that there is a growing number of people who are getting to be anxious uh, going through depression uh, suicide rates is increasing there is hysteria so that's number one, emotional well-being. And secondly, um, a spiritual well-being. Some Christians are beginning to have doubts, but a lot of people out there also are beginning to have questions and they're curious about Christianity, about the Bible. Uh, and the third one, the third one is relational well-being. Uh, people struggling with relationship with each other, uh, staying at home and some people are struggling and some uh, news that I read also they said that uh, there are some abuses that happen and uh, the fourth and the fifth are kind of equal in the survey this is the financial well-being and the uh, physical and safety well-being because of the economic downturn financial losses uh, loss of jobs uh, fear of uh, health and safety those things uh, and the good news about this is that the church the Church of Jesus Christ has the asset. We have the gift from God to attend to the top three needs that I just mentioned here. We have the good news. We have the gospel. We have the gospel of truth. We have, in short, we have God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit doing ministry right now, doing ministry to the people who are in need. And yes, God invites us God invites us to join Him to love others and to serve the world by reaching out and touching people's lives with the words of Jesus Christ. Uh, that is what is most important. The best thing we can give them is to tell them about Jesus Christ. Uh, in the church, we also do our best in continuing to serve uh, people by helping feed the homeless. Uh, we have a team that does this. Uh, we also distribute uh, to the homeless uh, face masks in our area. Um, but there are also a number of our members in the church who continue to minister as health workers. And we believe in the ministry of all believers. And so for many in the church, their vocation is their ministry. And of course, we salute them. So when it comes to helping people, uh, with their emotional well-being, spiritual well-being, or relational well-being, 
we have you we have the church the members of the church that can make a difference in the lives of people and God has given us this opportunity to give people the hope that they need for example even just a phone call uh, we can call and say uh, to them uh, how are they doing we can ask uh, what can I do to help uh, what can the church do to help them or do they have any prayer request uh, we can call not just church members but relatives and friends and um, that's something that we do we are a people of prayer so before we uh, close I'd like to lead us in intercessory prayer and I'd like you to join me in prayer so we can all be together I like to lead us in prayer and I will be uh, pause, pausing in silence and then I, I will ask you to pray for certain people that may come to your mind so in this way we will be able to pray for more people and pray for them more personally let us bow our heads our father in heaven we exalt you and we thank you Lord uh, we thank you for Jesus Christ who gave his life for us Lord thank you that he's alive and now Lord he is our hope he is our guide he is everything Lord to us and now Lord we just want to pray for the elderly uh, in the church outside the church and Lord I just pray now that you please be with this elderly whose names will be mentioned to you at this time Lord we also want to pray for the young ones and the children in the church please Lord be with this children and young people Lord whose names will be mentioned to you at this time And each of us, Lord, we have our own relatives and family members, Lord, all over the world. Lord, please be with these family members and relatives, Lord, that will be mentioned to you at this time. Thank you so much, great God, for hearing our, our prayers. Lord God in heaven, uh, we, we pray also, God, that uh, you will uh, grant us, Lord, to see how deep how high and how big lord your love is lord everything about you is incredible and help us to see you lord god that you are everything to us uh, that you are truly god what matters lord god nothing else matter no one else you are our loving father you sustain us you are in full control you know what you're doing and what you are doing Lord God is what is best for all of us and we know Lord God that you will put an end to this pandemic in your own time we put our trust in you and all this Lord we pray in Jesus name Amen uh, since we uh, report this worship service the attendance to our uh, home office if, if you can may I request please go to our YouTube chat uh, section and write how many people are with you right now worshiping with us and that will help us with our church report uh, thank you so much uh, to you all and and God bless you good afternoon church we're now going to enter to our portion of our service where we practice worshiping through giving, which I know looks a little different now that we are meeting online versus in a physical building. Uh, yet there are still the same ways that you can give. You can give online, you can give through texting, and you can mail in your offering via check. And so that information will be posted up on the screen. But I just want to talk a little bit about why it's so important for us to continue practicing giving and tithing during this time, because we still have the bills that we have to pay for our physical building, even though we're not meeting there. And the ministries that we're actively participating in, they're still going on, even though we're not meeting in person. We still have our children's ministry. We still have our ministry where we send out cards to people for birthdays and for other special occasions. And we still have our pastors, of course, who are still doing as much work, if not even more work during this time. And so it is so important for us to continue stepping out in faith 
and to, to give whatever we're able to do. And that's not just money, but that's also our time. And that is also our acts of prayer throughout the week as we're praying for those who are in our community. And in 1 Corinthians 15, verses, verse 58, it reminds us to give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because we know that it will not be in vain, because we know that God works uh, for good no matter what. And as long as we are trusting in Him, trusting that He will provide and that He will give us strength, then we know that good will come out of that, for our God is good and He is full of love. And so during this time, when you may be giving online or giving through text, I'm just going to pray a blessing over the offering. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you have given us, because we know that everything we have is yours and is because of you. And you love us so much, you've entrusted us with so much, Father. And in response to that, we want to give back. We want to commit ourselves to you. We want to follow your path. Father, so please guide us as we give what we are able to, as we give our money, our time, our devotion to you, Father. We know that you will bless it, and we know that you will multiply it. Amen. And now we're going to go into the musical portion of our service, which I think is just as important in a different way, because this is where we get to celebrate. We get to celebrate with our voices and with instruments and with singing along and with dancing even. And I want to read from Psalm 113 verse two, where it says, let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. And in some transla translations, it says, blessed be the name of the Lord. And I think that in no matter what circumstance we're in, whether we are in the good times, whether we are in the bad times, I think it's so important to bless our Lord's name because he is of our constant no matter what. And we know that he will see us through. And lastly, I want to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, where it says, Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So as we sing, as we worship today, let us rejoice, let us thank our Lord, and let us continually give Him praise. Hello everyone, um, my name is Annika and one of the things that God has been telling me about this whole quarantine time is to learn how to self-motivate and to create a routine myself that includes Him. Because for the past 11 years of my life I've been going to school, everything in my schedule revolved around school no matter what it was because school was the main focus of my life or one of the main focuses. Now that school has been gone because of the quarantine, I've had a lot of free time and things that I want to do but I just don't feel motivated to do and so one of those things was having to read the Bible or having self-devotional uh, self time. Usually I just pray and I don't really give that much time to God but now that I have so much free time, all these distractions gone, I actually have time to really do these things and that's what God's been telling me to do is work on my personal relationship with Him because there's so much free time and so that when my life gets busy again after this quarantine then I'll be able to incorporate him in my everyday life. During this quarantine we can't go outside. Three weeks ago we could. We could go outside, play games, like run around, go to the park, but now we can. We have to stay at home. Staying at home for me I don't really like because I have to see the same three people every single day in my house. And I would just like not have that to happen. I'd rather go outside and be on my own. But during this time, God has taught me to be slow to anger because sometimes I can be annoyed and stressed out at things and being very anxious over things like when will this end. Something that God has also told me is to be creative during this time because I've usually been just sitting down eating every single hour, snacks every single day, and just playing video games, not being up and getting active and doing some things that I normally wouldn't do during quarantine. During this time, we also have time to reflect on focus on him. 
And that's something I believe that everyone should be doing, including me during this quarantine, which I have. And I hope that everyone is staying safe during this time. And you guys have a good day indoors. I believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who creates the whirling, expanding universe with its countless galaxies and stars, the eagles and seagulls soaring in the sky, the incessant crashing waves on the seashore, and all that swims within them. I believe in the Father of all who knits together life, made in His very own image, in the secret quiet of our being, embedding eternity into our hearts. I believe in Jesus Christ, the one with no earthly father, with the dust of this earth between his toes, and with our names etched onto the palm of his hands, right beneath the nail scars, who now sits at the Father's right hand, making endless intercession on our behalf. I believe in the rock rolled away, in the fleshly body being raised, in the first fruits of the dead, and us rising in him soon, very soon. I believe in grace, symbolized by the cross as our only hope, our only claim, our only savior, and our only foundation. I believe in those footsteps in the sand, him carrying me, him I cling to, saddening, looking at the feet of our Lord Jesus, hanging on that tree, his lifeblood flowing down, washing us white, like white linen. It's all by his amazing grace lest any human should boast. I believe in the Holy Spirit, indwelling our very being, moving, whispering. I believe in living by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, and producing fruit in the Spirit. In the Spirit who helps us in our weakness with groaning that can't be expressed in words. The Spirit declaring who Jesus is. I believe in God's Word, a sure word a pure word, the only secure word. I believe the words on these pages are breath from the very holy of holies, the throne room of heaven. The scriptures are the love letter written from the heart of God, a lamp for stumbling feet to find sure footing on a dark, stony path. I believe there is more than believing. There is relating. There is living. And so, who am I? I am more than what my hands do. I am more than what my hands have. I am more than how other hands measure me. I am what is written on God's hands. Safe, embraced, His, beloved of God. Good afternoon, my brothers and sisters. Today's scripture passage is the 23rd Psalm. I'll start with a few introductory comments and hopefully provide some insight on the first two verses of this epic psalm. First, I'd like to mention that a few weeks ago, Pastor Burmy gave an excellent sermon on Psalms 23. He gave uh, very thorough explanations and applications for our life today, especially during these uncertain times. If you've not heard the sermon, I highly recommend it. It can be viewed on our Grace Life SoCal website and Grace Life SoCal YouTube channel. Verses 1 and 2. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters. He makes me to lie down in green pasture. This psalm has brought comfort to countless people, both believers and non-believers. It is a psalm so simple a child can grasp it, yet so deep theologians continue to excavate it for its richness. A full sermon can be preached on every single verse. 
In all of the 150 chapters of the Book of Psalms, there is no psalm more quoted, recited, memorized, inscribed on cards than Psalms 23, and is even the last words spoken by some of those who are dying, who are on their deathbed as they transition to heaven. Augustine called it the martyr's hymn because many Christian martyrs recited it as they went to their death to be tortured for Christ. Abraham Lincoln often referred to this psalm during his deep days of depression during the Civil War. George W. Bush recited it to a stunned nation after September 11, 2001. Written approximately 3,000 years ago, this psalm continues to impact humankind during our most difficult moments. David, who is or was a shepherd turned king, assumes the role of a sheep, a helpless animal that exists in utter dependence on the shepherd's care. When the Lord is our shepherd, you can count on him for everything you need. We shall not want. In John 10, 14, Jesus says of himself, I am the good shepherd. In verses 15 and 16 of that same John 10, speaks of the deep, intimate knowledge God has of us and the profound care and security and love he has for us. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The idea of God being our shepherd is one of the most comforting metaphors in all of the Bible. Isaiah 40 speaks to this. It states, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart and gently leads those who have young. Jesus is the good shepherd who leaves his flock of 99 sheep in order to find the one which is lost. The work of a shepherd was considered the lowest of all works. Shepherds had to live with the sheep 24 hours a day, and the task of caring for them was unending. Day and night, summer and winter, in fair weather and foul, they labored to nourish, guide, and protect the sheep, because sheep cannot take care of themselves. You can see the parallels. They have very little ability to defend themselves. Even if sheep are not directly bitten or survive an attack, they may die from panic or from injuries sustained. Sheep will die unless they have a shepherd that will take care of them. They require constant and meticulous care more than any other form of livestock. So it's no surprise that the Bible refers to us over 200 times as sheep. When sheep lack a sense, a deep sense of security, they move in constant agitation. They instinctively fear fast moving streams, but the Lord leads his own besides calm waters to provide refreshment, guidance, safety, security, and courage. We could count on God's steady love, his provision, his comfort, his guidance, every day of our lives. It is the work of Jesus on the cross that has made the spiritual realities and the comfort that comes from Psalms 23 applicable to us and obtainable by us. It is because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross that we have access. We have access to comfort and encouragement and so much more. All that he is, we have access to. 
There are many things you may be dealing with today, weaknesses or challenges, and you may be facing it and thinking, this psalm really just applies to King David and that he's of a certain breed, of a certain category of acceptance, and think, well, it doesn't apply to me because I don't measure up. My friend, David, had as many trials and challenges and difficulties and dysfunctions in his family as, as we. So uh, don't minimize your significance. Dismiss that thinking. God did not leave that burden on you or me. It is not what you do or don't do that makes the blessings and promises of God, of this psalm, applicable to you. But it's because Jesus made it freely available. Jesus, his blood, paid the price tag on these promises for you and me and all humanity. You see, Psalms 23 was written towards the end of David's life, where he was able to look back and realize that the burden wasn't on him to provide for himself. He came to realize that the obligation for his well-being was actually on God's shoulders, not his. That's something the Lord is teaching all of us as we learn to live this resurrected life. We are learning that it is not about us and what we bring to the table, but about God and what he brought to the table in Jesus for us. That's our place of rest. The book of Hebrews, the first four chapters in particular, talks about rest. What God has provided for us in Christ is rest. The first time we see rest in the Bible is in Genesis, where God created everything. And on the seventh day, he rested because everything was complete. It was finished and it was done. There was nothing else to do. In the same way, because of what Jesus accomplished and finished for us, God has provided us that rest. As Christians, we have entered into that seventh day, a place of rest where we actually sit down. Because all that needs to be done for our spiritual well-being has been accomplished in Christ. That's why in Ephesians, Paul says, we have been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. That's why David can say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. In just these two verses alone, we see no want, no lack, and rest for our beings. Jesus is awesome. He is awesome. In Hebrews 13, verses 5, he states, For he himself said, I will never leave you or forsake you, so that I can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The writer in Hebrews 13, 5, and David in Psalms 23, are, they're saying basically the same thing. They are coming from a confidence of knowing who God is. They know his character, his goodness, his faithfulness. God, our shepherd king, Jehovah Rohi, is committed to you to see that you have no lack, to provide you with bread for life and living waters that you will never thirst. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Barb, for that wonderful message. Our verse now is in Psalm 23, verse 3. He restores my soul. Jesus, the Good Shepherd, restores my soul, my inner being, the living being in me, myself, my person, all my desires, passion, appetite, emotion, that is my soul. He, Jesus, restores my soul. So when I backslide, run away, get distracted, 
or don't follow him, break relationship. If I faint or hide from him or run away from him, he brings me back gently. He comforts me. He refreshes me with the promises of his words and the consolations of his spirit. He is after my well-being. Every morning, fresh hope, outpourings of grace come to me. And that is great encouragement. Who else would do this but the one who has known me and loves me? He has my soul. He created my soul. Through Adam, he breathed. And Adam became a living soul. He knows me inside and out. Not through force, but with meekness and gentleness. Who better to restore us than Jesus, who really knows us and loves us? He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Notice the shepherd leads. The shepherd is in the front of the sheep. He's in front of his flock. He leads in us in the paths of righteousness. It may be the main road, the side road, the detour. It may be through the valley. It may be up in the mountain. But it is the right path. Why? Because He, Jesus, is full of righteousness. So I would like you to think about this. So when we pray, I'd like you to repeat after me. When we pray, say these words, Jesus, please lead me in the right path. When I need a decision, when I need a guidance, Jesus, lead me in the right path. You know, Jesus knows where he is going for his name's sake, and he guarantees it because he is perfect, he is righteous, and he won't abandon us, he won't change us, or he won't alter the course. When we are in a road trip and driving in a car, what are the usual questions of the passengers? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And the worst answer is no, we are lost. And as a driver, I, I won't uh, say that or I won't admit that. But Jesus is never lost. In fact, He knows the way. He is the way. So when we do not know where we are going, Pray to Jesus. Jesus, lead me to the path of righteousness. It is the right path. It may be hard. It may be difficult. It may be up the mountain, as I said. It may be down the valley. It may be up a tree or riding a boat or walking through the desert. But it is the right path. And you can trust Him because He guarantees it by His name. His reputation. He is perfect and He is never lost. Jesus is never lost. He knows the way and He is the way. Hello and let's go to verse 4. Verse 4 says, Yet though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I walk. The sheep is walking behind the shepherd. It is ridiculous to see a sheep, you know, running ahead of the shepherd, what will happen? It may stumble, it may fall, it may injure itself, it will break a leg, it may be eaten by predators because the sheep, the path, has not yet been cleared by the shepherd. And so, it is dangerous to run in impatient. And so, the best thing is to walk alongside the shepherd or with the shepherd. There are times, me, myself, I am impatient, and I cry to the Lord and say, Lord, deliver me quickly. I want to get out of this pain. I want to get out of this suffering. I can't handle it anymore. I will lose my mind. But sometimes I have to be patient and walk alongside with Jesus, with our shepherd. Remember, in verse 3, it is still the right path. 
And as I said, sometimes even though King David writes, even though I walk the val this valley, it is still the right path. Now the shadow that will not exist without a light shining on the other side. The light is always there. The sun is always there. Even if we are in a physical valley, we know that the sun is always shining. Even though it's covered with clouds, it is always there. And that is why King David wrote, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. His rod, the symbol of his power, his authority, and his protection. He wards off evil. Uh, for the sheep, it's the wolves and the lions. And his staff, they comfort me. If we wander around, if we get lost, if we don't know where we're going, or if we stray, he guides us back. He reels us in through the shepherd's crook. You know, the end of the, sh the staff, there is a hook, and he reels us in gently. And that is the promise of Jesus. It was because he is the shepherd. I would like you to visualize and see as you are walking through this valley, look at how the shepherd thinks. His perspective. The shepherd is looking forward, toward home. Let us cast, catch his vision. The shepherd has a vision. And what is the vision? The vision of going home in safety. The vision of going home whole, in joy. The vision of glory. The vision of being with him at home, safe and sound. Let us catch that vision and believe in it, that the shepherd is all for our well-being. That is why King David said, the rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I will fear no evil because you are with me. Let us catch and believe in the shepherd as he guides us through this valley of the shadow of death. And I'd like to add another thing. Sometimes there will come a time, not sometimes, but there will come a time that I will physically leave this earth. It is said in the Bible, it is appointed for man once to die. And if Jesus doesn't come in my lifetime, I will physically be gone. I will have no illusion. I will have no grandeur that I can live forever. I hope people will miss me. I hope, you know, uh, it will be easy on my loved ones, but I will be dishonest if I think that I won't die. Yes, I will die and live this earth. But there is comfort. There is peace. What is the proof? Have you watched a Christian die? Have you watched a Christian die? I have seen amazing peace and comfort. Christians of faith who are at peace and do not worry because they know they are in God's hands. Remember Stephen or Stephen, the first martyr, when he was, you know, being, he was cast into the pit and they throw stones at him. He looked up to heaven and he said, Father, forgive them and I, you know, for what they are doing. And he looked and saw Jesus and he was at peace. He knew where he was going. And that struck a chord or hit Saul, who became, later became Paul. And you see, death is not to be feared. It is not the end of the story, my friends and brothers and sisters. Remember, Jesus is with us throughout, and he will guide us home, wherever that is. It may be deliverance right now from our sufferings, or it may be heaven when we face that time. So I would like to encourage you that whatever happens, Jesus is our guide, is our shepherd, and he will be with us always. Hello, family. 
Greetings to you all in Jesus' name. And thank you, Pastors Barb and Ezer, for your introduction to Psalm 23 and your messages on verses 1 through 4. I will now be expounding on the last two verses of Psalm 23, verses 5 and 6. In the New Living Translation, Psalm 23, 5 to 6 reads, You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You welcome me as a guest, anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Verses 5 to 6 beautifully illustrate God's provision and the ultimate satisfaction we have when we experience him personally. It's interesting that in verse 5, David transitions the metaphor from God being the good shepherd to God being the gracious host. According to a devotional by Pastor Ray Stedman, he notes that this symbol of a gracious host who feeds and provides, leads and protects, this symbol of a gracious host grows right out of the historical situation in which King David wrote. When David was driven into the wilderness by his own son's rebellion, he found himself out in the desert, hungry and weary, his army in disarray. As recorded in 2 Samuel 17, three men who were not even Israelites, their names were Shobi, Makir, and Barsilai. These three men, these three foreign men who were thought to be enemies of David, they brought bedding and bowls and articles of pottery to him. They also brought wheat and barley, flour and roasted grain, beans and lentils, honey and curds, sheep and cheese for David and his people to eat. For they said, the people have become hungry and tired and thirsty in the desert. So even the people that were, David thought were his own enemies, they saw that David and, and his companions were hungry and tired and thirsty and they, out of their own compassion, chose to serve him, to help him. David saw in this radical act of generosity that God, as a gracious host, was preparing a table before him in the presence of who he once thought were his enemies. The Apostle Paul says it this way, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus, as it says in Philippians 4.19. It was an important lesson for David to learn that God provides for him through the most unlikely people, even people who were labeled as enemies. In other words, as the gracious host, Jesus feeds us and unites us with the presence of all people, from all nations and ethnic backgrounds. Jesus meets all our needs according to the rich inheritance that we have in him. Eternal life in his goodness, peace, love, forgiveness, grace, grace, graciousness, patience, mercy, and the list goes on and on. The second half of Psalm 23 verse five says, you welcome me as a guest, anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. As a shepherd in his younger years, David knew how to properly care for and lead his family's flock. One of the things David most likely had to do in caring for the sheep was to anoint them with oil. This oil acts as a repellent against deadly insects and serves to protect the sheep from injury, blindness, and even death. Therefore, this act of anointing with oil, anointing their heads with oil, became a symbol of blessing, protection, and empowerment. In addition, oil is also a biblical representation of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. So by the Spirit of God living within us, we have his abundant blessings, protection, power, and empowerment. 
And this resurrection power and love overflows from the inside when we are intimate with God. And his anointing overflows outwardly and graciously to our family, friends, communities, and the world. The last verse of Psalm 23 says this, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Other Bible translations translate this verse as God's goodness and love will follow me. But the word follow literally means pursue here. The word used here, the Hebrew word used here is radaf, meaning to pursue, to chase, run after, to seek, to press on for a purpose. In other words, God's goodness and love, it, they don't just follow us passively, as if it's just following behind us. But God's goodness and love actively pursue us. His goodness and love chase after us. His goodness and love seek us every moment of our lives. In addition, the pursuit of God's goodness and love for David is in stark contrast to his enemy's pursuit to dethrone and destroy him. In, in spite of God's own son, a, David's own son, this is David's own son pursuing to dethrone and kill him. David, in that situation, still chooses to remember that God's goodness and love also pursue him and that God's goodness and love are far more powerful and far stronger than even his enemy's pursuit of him to kill him. And lastly, David proclaims that he will live in the house of the Lord forever. This implies that he wanted to go back to the tabernacle, the place where God's presence was experienced, and he wanted to worship him there. But thanks to Jesus and his spirit that lives in us when we believe in him, the presence of God now resides in us, in you and in me, and we can experience his presence all the time. If you believe in the Son of God, He lives in you. His goodness and love are chasing after you and after me. So whatever may be pursuing you at this time, whether it be the enemies of disease, cancer, depression, defeated thinking, busyness, self-pity, or selfishness, Know that in Jesus, you have victory over all that this world will throw at you. We worship him in spirit and in truth because we know the truth is that God has conquered this world and that his goodness and love will pursue us all day, every day. This is the song of the shepherd taken from the Jesus Storybook Bible. God is my shepherd, and I am his little lamb. He feeds me, he guides me, he looks after me. I have everything I need. Inside, my heart is very quiet, as quiet as lying still in soft green grass in a meadow by a little stream. Even when I walk through the dark, scary, lonely places, I won't be afraid because my shepherd knows where I am. He is here with me. He keeps me safe. He rescues me. He makes me strong and brave. He is getting wonderful things ready for me, especially for me, everything I ever dreamed of. He fills my heart so full of happiness. I can't hold it all inside. Wherever I go, I know God's never stopping never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love will go to. God is faithful, and for that we worship him with our whole being and give thanks to him through our lives and the choices we make. Repeat this prayer after me with your palms up as a symbol of surrendering our cares to the Lord 
as we receive from him at the same time his goodness and love. So with our palms up, we surrender to him and receive from him at the same time. Father, I thank you that you are the good shepherd. Because you live in me, I have everything I need. You lead me. You feed me. You protect me. You pursue me. Thank you that you loved me first before I even knew you. Therefore, I surrender myself to you and I choose to love you, God, with all my heart, with all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you, church. In the year that Jesus was crucified, on the first day of the Festival of Unleavened Bread, Matthew 26 tells us, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Verse 18, he replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him. The teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Matthew goes out of his way to tell us that this was a Passover meal. The word Passover is used three times. Jesus was going to observe the Passover at that house on that evening. To a Jewish audience, or to anyone who knew the Old Testament story of the Passover, this would bring to mind the concepts of freedom from slavery, escape from death, and the story of how God formed the people as his nation on earth. Verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Well, they could tell that it wasn't his body. They knew that Jesus meant the bread represented his body. He was using a figure of speech, a metaphor, using one thing to represent another. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Again, they could tell that the cup itself was not blood. Not even the contents of the cup were blood. Jesus was just saying that the drink represented his blood. And the thing I want to bring out here is that Jesus connects the drink with the covenant and with the forgiveness of sins. This in the context of a Passover meal. Those three elements of the Old Testament Passover that I mentioned earlier are brought back to mind by what Jesus is saying. First, that when he pours out his blood, he is giving the people freedom from slavery. Now, the Jews in his day were looking for freedom from a foreign oppressor, namely Rome. But Jesus was bringing escape from a different sort of foreign oppression, namely sin. He was bringing, bringing forgiveness of sins. And with that comes the second meaning, the escape from death. When the Israelites escaped death in the original Passover, they weren't really escaping from death. They were just escaping from the threat of death. As it turns out, most of them eventually died in the desert because death is a bigger enemy than Egypt was. 
Jesus is giving us something bigger than Moses could, escape from sin and death. And the third picture commemorated by the Passover is the formation of a people, a people of God, or as the book of Exodus says, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Jesus picks up this idea with his mention of the word covenant. God brought his people out of Egypt and brought them to Mount Sinai where he made a covenant with them, a bond of loyalty that was formalized by sprinkling the blood of bulls. That was in keeping with ancient customs about making covenants of marriage, adoption, friendship, and international treaties. Jesus is saying that our covenant with God, the declaration of a bond of loyalty between us and God, is made through pouring out Jesus' blood, referring to his death on the cross. And this makes us his people, the kingdom of priests and holy nation that Israel could have been, but failed to be. First Peter says that the church is now the kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Jesus and his death on the cross is evidence of God's loyalty to us and through Jesus, we are loyal to him. When we observe the Lord's Supper or communion, we commemorate his death. And it's like agreeing to the covenant again and again. Whenever we do this, we pledge allegiance to the Lamb of God, thankful for what he has done for us, giving us his body and blood so that we are forgiven, so that we are free, and so that we are faithful to him. Let's now take the bread. Father, thank you for giving us this bread. And thank you for giving us Jesus, the bread of life. Bless this bread so that it helps us remember that Jesus gave his body for us and that we are now the body of Christ representing him on earth. Amen. Let us now take the drink. Father, thank you for the fruit of the vine. And thank you for Jesus, the drink that we all really need. Bless this cup that it might help us remember that Jesus poured out his blood for us so that we might be forgiven, free, and faithful to you. May he bless us all as we live in communion with Jesus. Hi, church family. I hope that you're all having a safe and healthy time in the comfort of your homes. And to close our service off, I would like to read from Romans 8, 38 through 39, which is in the Passion Translation. And it states, So now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I'm convinced that His power will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, or dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken His love. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. So with this verse, it reminds us that God's love triumphs all troubles and worries and gives us the full security we need to continue on with our lives through the Lord Jesus Christ. And with that, let us continue on to live with our mission statement to love God, love others, and serve the world. Um, also, there is a Zoom fellowship meeting after the service. And with that, I hope you all have a safe and healthy week. God bless.